three issues which are very hot right now in the United States. We'll talk about, I'm going to start out with patent eligibility, which is a very divisive issue right now, and maybe some of you have, uh, have been involved with that also. We're going to talk about Seth Fran, we're going to talk about PTAB, and we may uh, intersperse a little AI in there also, in, this, in particular with regard to, to patent eligibility. So we're going to start out with uh, the patent eligibility issues in the United States. So raise your hand if you do any prosecution of cases in the United States, you represent any clients which have local, maybe local patents which are uh, pending in the United States. Raise them high, it's right after lunch, raise them really high. Okay, don't be shy. Okay, huh? raise them high. Okay, um, raise your hand if you've had any 101 rejections in your cases, okay? And you're just absolutely baffled by what's going on in the United States on patent. Well, you can raise your hand and say you're baffled by what's going on in the United States, whether you have a case or not there. So you're still able to raise on that thing, because we're baffled ourselves. Okay, so it seems like the rest of the world, including Europe, including China, has no problem with what patent eligible subject matter is. Um, as we know, in the PCT, um, you can get a patent in, quote, any field of technology. Um, and in Europe, um, they talk about technological solutions, seems to be, um, you know, kind of a non-issue there, and as well as in China and, and in other countries. But, um, for the reasons we're going to talk about, it's become a very big deal in the United States. Okay, um, and we're, I've got some slides on this, and so we're going to be pulling up those slides right now, um, just so you can follow along. Okay. Um, can you get on there? Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So we're going, to, we're going to talk about um, slides first. Let's see if we go to this. Okay, 101, patentable subject matter, patent eligible subject matter. What this means is this is the threshold test for whether subject matter is eligible to be considered for patent protection under the novelty, obviousness, inventive, and um, 112 standards of enablement and written description. So first on this slide, I've got the statute. That's the literal wording of the statute, um, 35 U.S.C. 101. Okay, and that's a pretty um, well-known statute. You know, you you would think it's very non-controversial. Whoever invents or discovers um, a new and useful process, um, manufacture, composition of matter, or um, what's the other one? Machine. Oh, machine. Thanks, Bob. Okay. Um, is eligible to get a patent. So you think, okay, that's pretty easy. However, our case law coming out of the US Supreme Court has come up with a very different test for what's patent eligible subject matter. We refer to that as the um, Alice Mayo test after two well-known cases that came out of the US Supreme Court, Alice versus CLS Bank and Mayo versus Prometheus. And in those two cases, the Supreme Court instead of really looking at the statute and saying whoever invents or discovers, um, now says that you have to look at judicial exceptions to patent eligible subject matter. And there are four judicial exceptions to subject matter eligibility, and that becomes the step one of the threshold test. So you look at whether there's an abstract idea, law of nature, um, or a... Um, to, Natural, natural phenomena. <laughs> you look at those three first, and then um, if you find that the patent claim involves one of those, then you look to see whether there's significantly more, whether there's an inventive concept. Well, um, under uh, the U.S. Constitution, the United States has a form of government where the, where the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Okay, under Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the U.S. Constitution um, says that Congress has the sole right to create patent law. Um, now, that should mean that, that statute is the law of our land, not the case law coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court, if it's considered that the case law is inconsistent with the statute. Um, 
I, I spoke at AIPLA conference a few weeks ago, um, and I offered one million dollar reward if anyone could go from the statute using normal statutory construction principles um, and get to the Supreme Court case law. Um, and there were about 200 people in the room, and I thought, wow, if I lose this bet, I'm out a lot of money, um, about $200 million. But it turns out that that bet's very safe because it's absolutely impossible to go from that statute using normal construction principles and getting get to the Alice Mayo test. Uh, there has been lots of um, uh, events going on about that. You can imagine what this does to the patent office. Bob used to be at the patent office. How does the patent office apply the test? Does it apply the statute? Does it apply the Alice Mayo test from the Supreme Court? Um, it's got uh, a lot of examiners. How many examiners do we have now? Probably okay. 9 to 10,000. Okay, 9 to 10,000 examiners. One of the goals of the patent office is to train 9 to 10,000 examiners on what patent eligible subject matter is. And when there's a lot of controversy and what it actually is and what test to apply, that makes the um, executives of the patent office, like, like Bob, like Director Iancu, like, like uh, former Director Kapos, uh, gives them a very hard job. Um, I think they've actually been doing an incredible job uh, of trying to balance all of the rights and, and try to protect the rights of um, patent applicants. Um, and actually, among, uh, among the branches of Congress and, and among the, I'd say, the, the groups involved, I think the U.S. Patent Office has really done the best it can in the circumstances with the patent eligibility law. And I'm sure that um, Bob has a comment on that also. Um, so what, what um, I did, along with a colleague, was that uh, I was completely bewildered by this, along with some uh, most others in the United States. So I decided that um, a colleague and I were going to spend almost a year doing legal research. Um, and I said, well, we'll get into an issue like this. Um, let me see if I can get to the next. How do I get to the next thing? Let's see if you can get to the next. I'm glad it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll go ahead and I'll keep going. Uh, so what we did was, when, we, when you get to something that's as confusing as this, it's best to get back to first principles and say, how in the world did this happen? So we decided to start at the very beginning, which was when the Constitution went into effect, going back to the very beginning of the United States. The Constitution was, was ratified in 1787. Okay, in 1790, we had our first Patent Act in the United States. So a colleague and I went through and we read every single patent eligibility statute in the history of the United States from 1790 all the way through the American Events Act in 2011. And we traced the language through 